Welcome back to the channel. I hope you enjoy. I drove home in the fog one night. I regret it for the rest of my life. Three years after graduating college, I decided I needed a break from the corporate grind. The 45 minute commute, early mornings at the office, and late nights on the computer took their toll on my physical and mental health. This amount of stress culminated in me waking up one night with chest pains and feeling short of breath. Convinced I was having a heart attack, I called 911 and was transported to the ER. A few hundred in medical bills later, I was diagnosed with panic disorder. Although my mental health had never been perfect, I had never experienced anything this intense and was shocked stress could have this much of a physical effect. Against the advice of my parents, former academic advisor, and colleagues, I quit my first grown-up job less than two years in. Luckily, I had always been somewhat of a saver and had worked my way through college, so I had some time to figure things out before the bills would start piling up. I found a much closer job at a small bar and grill called Al's. It was in a pretty remote location, but was often pretty busy since it was the only restaurant and bar in the village. The atmosphere at the restaurant was like night and day compared to my office job. I could wear a t-shirt and jeans, start time was never earlier than 10am, and my coworkers felt like friends rather than competition. I loved working there and still look back on the two years I spent there fondly, despite what happened. It was a Friday night, and we were preparing to close at midnight. Sometimes we stayed open later, but the last few bar guests cleared out early that night. Jean, a server in her early 20s, sat at the counter counting her tips while Ben and I restocked the bar and washed the last few beer glasses. Better hurry up before that fog spreads, Jean said in a joking voice. You know I'm staying across the street tonight, Ben responded, sounding annoyed. Ben's parents lived just down the street from the restaurant, and he would sometimes stay there if he was too tired, or too intoxicated, to drive home from the late shifts. I glanced outside. It didn't look too bad in the village, but out towards the main road leading back to where I lived, the fog was so thick the road disappeared. Driving through, that's gonna be a bitch. I said, shaking my head. Suddenly, Ben and Jean looked up from what they were doing. They exchanged tense-looking glances. Where do you live? asked Jean. Warlington, I answered. Jean looked pale. You realize you can't drive all the way back tonight, right? She asked. They should have let you go earlier before it got bad. I mean, I have to. I said, confused. Where else would I stay? You don't know anyone in town? Jean asked. I shook my head. Then you can stay with me if you need to. You can crash on the couch. Just don't go out in the fog at night. Especially on 23. It's dangerous. There's so many accidents already with normal visibility. Imagine how dangerous it is when you can't see 10 feet in front of you. She wasn't wrong. 23 was notorious for deadly accidents being a rural, yet busy two-lane highway with a ton of sharp turns. I'd had a few close calls driving to and from Al's already. I was still shocked she offered to let me stay at her place. We were friendly, but she'd never given any indication she was interested in anything more but her offering to let me stay over to avoid some minor driving conditions seemed extreme. It wasn't like it was a snowstorm. I agreed to stay the night for both reasons of safety and being curious to see if she did see me as more than a friend. I had to help Ben put away a few things in the walk-in so Jean said I could meet her outside and follow her to the apartment when I was done. Hey, do you think Jean's into me or something? I asked Ben once we were alone. I'm surprised she actually invited me to stay over. Ben shrugged. Maybe, he said. Ben wasn't his usual self tonight. He was usually outgoing and boisterous. 
On the slower weekend nights, he was known to sneak some drinks back to the break room, but tonight he had been fairly quiet and remained completely sober. We got our closing tasks completed for the night, and I was getting ready to walk out the door when Ben stopped me. Hey man, seriously, don't drive in that fog tonight. I don't care what happens at Jean's, just wait until morning to head back. This was out of character for Ben. He didn't have a reputation of being a safe driver. He regularly drove under the influence and wasn't opposed to a street racing. I wanted to know why this was such a big deal to him, but was exhausted and knew Jean was outside waiting for me. I nodded. No worries, I'll see you tomorrow, I said, waving to Ben. It was less than a five minute drive to Jean's apartment. She lived in an older duplex. She grabbed some blankets and a pillow from the closet and put them on the couch for me. I thanked her. I felt pretty awkward at this point. It felt strange spending the night at her apartment when we only ever saw each other at work or the occasional bonfire or party. Luckily, Jean broke the ice by putting on a Marvel movie. We were both fans of, of the Marvel Universe. We watched a few movies, smoked, and ate some snacks. It was starting to be clear to me that she didn't have any interest in me romantically, but I was okay with that. She was still a good friend and I really enjoyed her company. After a while, my mind drifted back to Ben's strange demeanor tonight. Did you notice how Ben was tonight? He was quiet as hell and didn't have a single beer. Yeah, don't worry about it. He always gets like that when it's foggy out. He doesn't like to talk about it, but he saw a bad accident out there a few years ago when there was a fog and it was hard to see. He wouldn't tell me much about it, but it must have been pretty gory. I nodded. That made sense. Jean decided to head to bed after the movie was over and I got settled in on the couch. I was just starting to doze off when my phone rang. I jumped up and quickly silenced it. It was my roommate, David. I figured whatever he was calling about could wait until morning and tried to go back to sleep. Then I saw a text. Call me now, it read in all caps. Annoyed, I got up and stepped out onto the porch to avoid waking Jean up. I called David back. What's so important you need to call me at 2am, I asked. Our fucking house got broken into, responded David. Are you kidding me? I asked. No, I just called the police and they're on their way. I just got home from Jenny's and it looks like the door back door was kicked in. The locks broke. The place is totally ransacked and our TV's gone. What about my Xbox? I asked, nervous. I'm sorry, man. I don't see it here. David responded. I'm on my way, I said and quickly hung up. I quietly gathered up my things and folded up the blanket. I decided to leave quietly and text Jean in the morning to let her know what happened. I didn't see the point in waking her up and I wasn't in the mood to be talked out of going to see what all had been stolen. I was getting angrier by the second. I hated how rampant theft was in Worlington, and was even angrier remembering how many hours I spent at a job that almost killed me to earn everything I owned. I texted David to let him know I may take longer than usual to get home since I would have to go slow to get through the fog on 23. Once I got onto the highway and realized how thick the fog was, my rage subsided a bit. I knew I'd have to stay fully focused on driving. I was pretty tired so I turned on the radio to help me stay alert. I drove 25 despite the 55 mile per hour speed limit. I couldn't see anything. The fog was the worst I'd ever seen, even worse than snow blindness. Almost every station on the radio was breaking up. The only station I could get a signal on was by some folky sounding country station. I eventually gave up and turned it off, annoyed. I started to see some light through the fog so I slowed down a bit. I quickly realized that there was a pickup truck on the side of the road with the hazard lights on. I slowed to a stop behind it and got out. There was a man who looked like he was in his fifties sitting in the driver's seat with the door open. 
He was mumbling and crying, hat in his hands. Um, sir, are you okay? I asked. He continued to mumble and sob at the same time. Do you need help? I can call someone, I said. He looked up, appearing very distressed, and his face was very red. The phones don't work out here. We're screwed. We're screwed. We're dead. He said as he began to hyperventilate. What's going on? I can help you, I tried. They messed with my truck. I looked away for one minute and my truck won't start, he stammered. Look, man, it's okay. I'll call a tow truck for you and the police if you need me to, so it'll be fine. He continued to sob and hyperventilate while I pulled out my phone and dialed 911. I tried three times and the call wouldn't go through because of bad service. I knew this area didn't have the best reception, so I told him I was going to walk up the road a ways to try to get service. It's no use, it's no use, he kept repeating. I started to feel like I was a little out of my element. I didn't know how to calm down someone who was hysterical, and I had no idea how his truck was damaged since it looked fine from the outside. If someone really did mess with his truck, were they still out here? I walked about 50 feet away from where we were parked and again tried to call 911. Still no service. I cursed Verizon's coverage and walked back to the man in the truck. Hey, I'm not having any luck right here, but if you want to come with me up the road to the gas station, we can call for help from there. No, he snarled. You're one of them. He began mumbling things under his breath that didn't make sense. I've been out here six fucking hours. Nothing's real. The road should have ended miles ago. I started to fear this may be a mental health issue rather than a car issue. It's okay. You're safe now. I can take you up the road and everything will be fine. The man didn't take this well and began fumbling around for something in the glove compartment. To my horror, he pulled out a shotgun. I stepped back. I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to hurt you. It's fine, I'll go. He continued to point it at me until I was out of sight. I ran to my car, slammed the door, and peeled out of there. That's the end of part one. Thanks for taking the time to listen to one of my videos. I'll catch you in the next one. Ciao.